Good morning, everybody. Welcome back from the uh, weekend. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, so our goal for this week is to get chapter 10 under our belts, right? Big chapter, lots of stuff going on. Um, next week is chapter 11, sort of another big chapter. Um, and then it's spring break, if I read the calendar correctly. Right, so it's like this week, next week, spring break, and you come back to what? An exam that Thursday after spring break. I thought about trying to cram the exam into next week, and I was like, no. I mean, there's two things. It's both good and bad, right? Like, we get it over with, spring break, you can just totally relax, but then there's the other part that, no. <laughs> it's death. It's a choice. So. We'll, uh, we'll take the exam as planned after spring break. Uh, what I did plan on is the Monday and Wednesday. So like Wednesday we'll review for the Thursday of the exam, but like Monday's also going to be a review. Only it's me driving the review on Monday, right? Trying to get your guys' spring break brains cleared out, right? And back into the groove, and then Wednesday you come with questions, and then we'll take the exam. But that's the plan. And um, we're going to try to stick to it. All right. Uh, so continuing on with the kinematics of rolling motion. So um, th there's a bit of a problem that we need to talk about. Okay, and it's this: uh, what direction is this wheel spinning? Counterclockwise, right? And so now, which way is it going? Clockwise. So clockwise and counterclockwise is a pretty good way to talk about the direction of a wheel spinning, okay? But it has one obvious flaw, right? What direction is it spinning? <coughs> Counterclockwise, right? Are you sure? See the problem? Okay, so clockwise and counterclockwise depend on point of view. And there's nothing more frustrating in physics and engineering than having something change just because the point of view changes. Right? And so that's why we've developed a way to be entirely consistent all the time about the direction things are turning. And it involves something called a right hand rule. It's pictured on the screen. Okay? So I'm going to be introducing you to a couple different right hand rules in this section. And you'll want to be familiar with how to do them. So this is like a sort of a first introduction. These really come into play in chapter 11 because in chapter 10, we sort of take out all these right hand rules and we talk about clockwise and counterclockwise because we can always just sort of draw the picture on our paper. Starting in chapter 11, we're going to need all the right hand rules. So I want to introduce it to you now and then I'll introduce it to you again. It'll be the second time your brain sees it and hopefully it'll be a little bit easier. But to do the right hand rule, everybody put your right hand in the air. This is the calibration. I'm just checking, right? Okay, good. You know which hand is your right hand. You put them down. Right? Um, to quote one of the um, preeminent and renowned and correct um, psychologists of the modern era, uh, his name is Winnie the Pooh. Um, Winnie the Pooh said, uh, I have no trouble telling my right paw from my left. It's knowing which one to start with that makes all the difference. Anyway, okay, take your right hand, okay, and what you're going to do with your right hand is you're going to make the hitchhiker symbol, okay, so fingers curled into your palm with your thumb extended, wrap, wrap those fingers around in the direction that the wheel is spinning, okay, so if it's spinning, was this counterclockwise, right, I wrap my fingers into my palm counterclockwise, and which way is my thumb pointing? Towards you guys, right, okay, so if I turn it, right, like this, now how do I wrap my fingers? This way, and my thumb is now pointing the opposite direction. So it turns out, right, that no matter how I orient the wheel, my thumb always points a consistent direction with the rotation. So this is the power of the right hand rule. Like, it doesn't matter. So you're on that side of the wheel and it's counterclockwise for you, right? But on my side of the wheel, it's clockwise. But both of us, K 
can do the right hand rule, right? You guys do the right hand rule on your side. Which would be like this, right? I do the right hand rule on my side, which would be like this, and our thumbs are all pointing in the same direction, which is out into the room, right? So that's the beauty of that right hand rule, okay? Notice it always, no matter which way you're doing it, okay? It's always pointing along the axis of rotation. So strictly speaking, the direction, the vector for angular velocity, that vector points in or out of the screen, okay? If we drew a circle, say on the board, right? And it was going counterclockwise, we'd wrap our fingers and we'd say the angular velocity is pointed out of the screen or out of the board, okay? That, that would be real strict and we'll get into that in chapter 11. For now, we'll just say it's rotating counterclockwise or clockwise. We'll, we'll use that a lot. Um, it's, it's not bad, it's just we need to recognize that if we're working in 3D space, we need a better way to talk about what's going on. Okay, so let's do some rotational kinematics. So we're stepping back really into chapter two. We're not gonna do anything, we're not gonna do like projectile motion with rotating objects, okay? We wanna talk about um, how to handle changes in angular velocity, angular acceleration, time, all of those things. And uh, let's see here. We had, there was a toolbox, wasn't there? Remember that nice, nice toolbox? It's nice and explicit and spelled out. And it was a nice crank to turn. It started with it. I know I'm writing on the board. I'll, I'll take a picture for the iPad here in a second, okay? And we had delta v naught t plus one half a t squared. And then we have it was a, a b squared equals b naught squared plus two a delta x. I think I got them all right. Okay, remember those? All right. To do this in rotation, and I'll do some examples of what this looks like. What we're going to do is we're just going to put togas on everything. We're just going to go Greek. Okay. Now, I could derive all of these things for you, and it would be a phenomenal waste of time because you're all engineers don't care about der uh, derivations. Okay? So let's, uh, let's just, let's just do it the, the quick way. Um, instead of a V, what am I going to write down? What's the symbol for angular velocity? Careful. Omega. Okay? Okay. So in instead of final velocity, we'd have final angular velocity. Instead of initial velocity, we'd have initial angular velocity, omega naught. Instead of A, we're going to replace that with alpha. alpha. And instead of T, just T. Okay. Right, that, was, that was a trick. OK, how do we talk about position, or like how far we've gone in a circle? What's changing? The it's the angle, right? And so instead of delta x, it's going to be delta theta. And then we have omega naught t plus 1 half alpha t squared. For the third one, omega squared equals initial omega naught squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. And there we go. We have the toolbox for angular kinematics. We can now handle anything moving in a circle using its native language of angular position, angular velocity, angular acceleration. I'm going to throw on here as, as bonuses, okay, the relationship between these two toolboxes. Really, maybe, well, yeah, I'll leave them over here. But really, this equation right here helps straddle, okay? We can actually, you can actually toss this one in here and then you'll get all of these equations over here, okay? And then there was a uh, tangential acceleration was equal to R alpha, okay? Those are all um, sort of new things. And again, these are, th this is the Google Translate right here, okay? For getting back and forth between linear things, tangential, right, to the circle, and the things that are going around in a circle. So there's, there's our toolbox for angular kinematics. All right, as promised, let me get this onto the PDF. Oh, come on. There we go. And 
Done. All right. So now you have a copy of all those equations. And I can have them on the board and go to the next slide and refer back to them as we go. Amazing. OK. So a um, little bit of a personal life story here from Mr. Bailo. Um When I was a freshman in college, I worked for a hard drive company. And uh, it was part time. And I was in pre-sales technical support. So I provided technical support to people that had not yet bought a hard drive. That's how complicated hard drives are. You need technical support before you even buy it. We would get called up by uh, server manufacturers and would help them figure out which drive would be best for whatever application they were using in their server, right? Um, they might tell us that they need this much storage, and we'd say, okay, well, you need this drive because it gives off this much heat or this much noise or whatever. Anyway, I worked for this hard drive company, and uh, I got data. This isn't secret data. I'm not, you know, tossing customer, customer secrets out here. But one of the things that, to measure hard drive performance is something called spindle speed. So hard drive, I know this is... This is borderline ancient technology now, isn't it? Right? Because everything's like solid state, blah, 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 right? Okay. Hard drives are very much current technology because everything in the cloud is more or less stored on a hard drive. If it's long term, it's on a hard drive. And if it's really long term, like archival, like backup, and sometimes if you go to your backup provider and say, I need this file, and they say, okay, we'll get it to you tomorrow, that means that they're going to the tape backup. We st there's still tape machines that you that we use. Tape is actually fantastic for backing up. It's slow, but man, it lasts for forever. So uh, hard drive is still very much in play. Hard drive consists of these circular platters, right, and a motor that spins those platters. And there's something called a spindle speed that gives you, uh, it's one of the things that indicates performance of the drive. The faster the spindle speed, the faster the data can go on and off the, um, the surface of the platters. It's stored magnetically on those platters, okay? So we know that uh, for a certain model drive running at 7,200 RPMs, which is considered um, a high performance uh, hard drive, um, standard ones nowadays are like, uh, 4,800 RPM, 5,400 RPM, 7,200 RPM, there's a 10,500 RPM, and sometimes you can find 15,000 RPM drives. It really depends on how, how much you search. Um, the problem is, is the faster they go, the sooner they fail. So um, you, either, you either go fast and die young, right, or you go slow and last a long time. So again, it depends on what it is you're trying to do. All right, so we know that the motor can accelerate that drive, okay? And we know that the drive has to achieve 7,200 RPM in order to get into its operational state. One of the sort of things that um, server manufacturers needed to know was how long would it take the drive to spin up? In the event of a power failure, a hot swap, or anything is going on, how much time after I plug that drive in is it ready to go? And there's, there's a lot more than just spinning up the disks. The controller needs to do some stuff anyway. Okay, Let's see, right? Let's calculate how long it takes right, for this drive to spin up given these parameters. So back when we, back when we did chapter 2 or chapter 4. Do you remember what our problem solving process was, like the details of it? We know we're going to visualize, we know we're going to strategize, do it, check it. We know those four steps. But do you remember like specifically kind of what we did to organize our thoughts? Okay, so we had givens and like we made, didn't we make a list? Yeah, no. Right? Okay. So, yeah, some of you are like, I didn't, I never made a list, Mr. Bailey. <laughs> Where does the list come from? Yeah, it's just right. I'm just whatever the symbols are in the toolbox. Those are things I could know and not know, right? And so there we go. I've got the things from the tool. Do we know the final angular speed? Seven thousand two hundred in weird units, right? It's seven thousand. 
200 RPM, which stands for revolutions per minute. Okay, well, we're going to need to fix that because the standard unit for angular speed is what? Radians per second. Yeah, I know radians doesn't have a unit, but we still say it. Okay. Uh, do we know the initial angular speed of the drive? Yeah, it starts at rest. Okay. We are given alpha, 30 revolutions per second squared. I'm going to call that positive, right? Because it's speeding up, it's getting faster. Uh, I don't know how much time it takes, but that's okay. That's the thing I'm looking for. And do I know how far it turns. Do I know how many radians the, the platters go through? Does it give any information about distance? No. All right. So uh, turn to your neighbor and tell them or discuss, figure out uh, your strategy. That's what you know. What you don't know, what's your strategy? Which of these equations are you going to use to solve for the time? Go. <laughs> All right, it shouldn't have taken long. Which one? First one. Because we know everything except the time in that one, right? And so strategy is what? Solve for T, away we go. So T is going to be equal to omega minus omega naught over alpha. That's just, that's doing some algebra. Now, before I go ahead and throw some stuff in here, let's talk units. Okay? So we're given revolutions per minute and revolutions per second squared. Can I just toss those numbers in there and expect to get the right answer? The time is all wrong. So at a, bit, at a minimum, I've got to turn revolutions per minute into revolutions per second. Because then I would have revolutions and revolutions, and that might be OK. But I just want to warn you against using non-standard units. You can, as long as you're careful and make sure everything's in revolutions, everything's in, I mean, we could do this in hours or eons or millennia. It doesn't matter what the time unit is. We just need to make sure it's all the same. The safe thing to do. The absolutely safe thing is go back to the standard SI unit. So the standard SI unit for angular velocity is radians per second. And the standard SI unit for acceleration would be radians per second squared. So let's just practice doing that, okay? Even though it's possible to do revolutions per second, let's, do, let's just do that. So we got, we got to do some conversions here, right? We got to take 7,200 revolutions per minute and get that integrated. So what, what are we doing now? What chapter problem are we doing now? Oh. Chapter one, it's always there, right? Converting units. <clears throat> uh, revolutions or minutes, which one do you want to convert first? Minutes? We know that one, right? Okay. Minutes, top or bottom? Top. So in one minute, how many seconds are there? 60 seconds. Okay, so we got that one done. The minutes are going to cancel. Now, revolutions. For every revolution, how many radians are there? Yeah, so 2 pi radians. And that, that's how you go, right? That's how you just convert things. Take one of the units at a time, top or bottom, doesn't matter what order you do it in. And um, in the end there, I'll get radians per second. So I take 7,200, multiply by 2 pi, divide by 60, or... Take 7,200, multiply by pi, and divide by 30, whichever way you want to do that. Uh, and uh, I get to the right note page. No, I don't, because I don't have, where's my notes for this one? Why do I have 3,600 revolutions per minute? I don't know. What's this number? Sometimes I wonder if pages fall out. Like, like you go, you go away for you know winter break, and all the elves come in and just take. Here it is. I just can't read. All right. 
754. Radians per second. And if anybody else, did anybody else calculate and get the same number? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so we got that one. That, that's our omega, right? Uh, now we need to do our alpha. Get that in from, from 30 revolutions per second. Do we need to do anything about the second squared? No, the second squared is okay. So for every one revolution, two pi radians, which means this is 60 pi radians per second squared. Or if you don't like pi is always floating around, uh, 188.5 uh, radians per second squared. All right, there we go. Now we're safe. Safe in the sense that if we put standard units in, we should expect standard units out. And since we're solving for time, what unit should we get out? Seconds. So now I can just drop the numbers in to this. So T is equal to 754 minus 0 all over 188.5. We'll put a positive sign on it because it's speeding up. And we get 4 seconds. I'm close enough to 4 to call it 4. Okay. Will the homework be this easy? <laughs> okay. Basically, will the homework be this easy? Of course it won't. Because <laughs> it's all homework, right? And there's two features going on here. One of them is, yes, the homework is always harder because I give you the hardest problem when the homework is preparing for, over preparing for the exams, right? Okay. The exam should be very similar to this, right? Um, you could probably expect maybe a speeding up and a slowing down on the homework, right? In which case, fair game to have that on the exam. The other thing that's going on here is that you are in class and I am guiding you. And as you sit there by your lonesome, right, doing your homework, there's no voice in your head that's guiding you through, right? Right? So please work with each other, right? Be the voice for each other and bounce those ideas off each other. And you know, the homework will feel easier, it will go faster, and you'll be more successful. Um, four seconds was a common time that we quoted to the people that would call us up and want to talk about hard drives. Uh, and um, nowadays, a lot of hard drives will. Depends anywhere from three and a half to six seconds, uh, depending on the manufacturer, the storage size, the spindle speed, blah, 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 blah. All right. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, interesting. Okay. So now they're asking a slightly different question, right? So there is a speed at which the data is actually moving past the read-write head on the drive. There's this little tiny armature. Kind of see it? A little bit right here in this picture. This armature swings back and forth. So it can read on the inner part of the platter, and it can go all the way out and read at the outer part of the platter. And the drive, the information will be stored um, at various places on the drive. And there's a performance benefit to where that data is actually physically stored on the platter. Because where is the data moving the fastest? The inner or outer part of the yeah. It's a little bit of a trick question. In terms of angular speed, which one's moving faster? In terms of like radians per second, it's the same. Remember the quiz? Okay, it doesn't matter where you are on the radius, your angular speed will be the same because you go, but the tangential speed does change, right? The tangential speed is a function of the radius. So omega being the same for all points on the platter, the bigger your radius, the bigger your tangential speed is. And that's what the read-write head cares about. It doesn't care about angular speed. It cares how fast are ones and zeros going underneath, right, my sensor. And by ones and zeros, we mean various magnetizations on the surface of the drive. So to do part B here, okay, uh, we're going to employ V equals R omega. We know what omega is. We know the drive is operating 754 radians per second. What we want to find out is what the tangential speed is in meters per second, right underneath that read right head, if it's at the inner radius of one and a half centimeters versus the outer radius of four centimeters. So the speed at 1.4 centimeters is going to be the radius, so what am I going to write down? 
What number? What unit do I put it in? Yeah. Got to put it into meters. So 1.4 centimeters is 0 0.014 meters. Do I buy 100? And then I put in 754 radians per second. This is going to turn out in meters per second. And uh, when I do that, it's 11.31 um, meters per second. Or, for those of you that still live in America, 25.3 miles per hour. We do the same thing at, uh, what was the other one, 4 centimeters? So 0 0.04 times 754, that's going to get me 30.16 meters per second, or approximately 67.5 miles per hour. So, yeah? Isn't that 1.5 instead of 1.4? 1.5. I had too many fours. Sorry. Yes, thank you. I was, I was already on the other one. And, and numbers and I, it's, it's Monday. We'll blame it on them. Thank you. 25 miles an hour on the inner part, 67, 68 miles an hour on the outer part. And the drive is programmed to be able to handle that difference in speed. In fact, you can play some pretty interesting um, games with speed, and the drive will try to put information that's accessed more frequently on the outer parts because that information needs to be grabbed fast. Things that it doesn't need very often, it will try to store on the inner parts of the platter where it's, it's moving a little bit slower and, and the read speed will be a little bit slower. It's all controlled by the logic of the controller on the drive. Um, there are hard drives. So uh, hard drives come in different sizes and they also, like I said, come in different speeds. There were some prototype drives that were being made uh, by a manufacturer I worked for. I worked for Seagate, by the way. Um, and the, and I, the only reason I worked for Seagate as a part-time job is because I went down to the temp agency and, hey, do you have any jobs? And Seagate headquarters happened to be like 10 miles down the road. So <laughs> in, in a little place called Scotts Valley that nobody really knows where that is. Um, and so they said they just need 10 people. And I went down there initially to just sort of answer phones and type letters and things like that, and then they discovered I was a nerd, and they said, no, come this way, and they took me into the technical support area. Um, so the Seagate was working with prototype drives that had spindle speeds of like 50,000 RPM, 64,000 RPM, like super high spindle speeds for, for servers. The problem was is that the platters kept blowing up. So they would spin them up, and then the platters would just shatter. They would, they would explode, okay? And uh, so they couldn't figure out what was going on until they realized <laughs> what was going on is the inner, part, the inner part of the platter was going really fast. And the outer part of the platter was going so fast that it broke the speed of sound. For a given spindle size and a spindle speed, okay, there was a limit. And if the inner part had not broken the speed of sound and the outer part had, was basically making little sonic booms, the, it would set up this like deformation in the surface of the platter. And as it spun around, that deformation would cause the a mechanical failure of the glass that they make the platters out of. Um, so they uh, did it in a vacuum and it worked just fine. Okay, but um, running hard drives in a vacuum is just hard. So, yeah, that's why we don't have 50,000 RPM hard drives. And instead, um, we now just do solid state drive. If you want, here's some free computer advice. The one thing you want to upgrade in your computer, okay, to make it feel like a new computer, make it feel fast, is put a solid state drive in it. Like replace any hard drive you may have that's like the boot drive or, you know, the main drive of the computer. If you can have somebody replace that with a solid state drive, it will feel like a new computer. Like, I'm a magician when it comes to computers. People, oh, my computer's so slow. I'll go in, I'll replace their drive with a solid state drive, and it's like, I do nothing else. It's like a miracle. Oh, it's a brand new computer. It's not. I just, I made it faster. That's all I did. All right. Let's talk rolling motion. Okay. So just to make sure you make the connection. Okay. 
<clears throat> we can talk about objects that, and we're going to get, I think most of your homework for rolling motions in chapter 11, but we do need to talk about it because we're going to start rolling things like down, down hills and stuff. Okay, so if I want this wheel to roll across the surface of the desk, does there need to be friction? Yes, if this were a frictionless surface, the wheel wouldn't turn, it would just translate, wouldn't it? Okay, and so there's two motions here, okay? The center of the wheel is moving sideways, okay? And the wheel is rotating. We're going to do a lab this week called center of mass. That's our next lab, isn't it? Okay. Um, and so I'm not going to teach you about center of mass in lecture. I'm actually going to lecture in lab for about 30 minutes to teach you about center of mass. And then after that, you will you'll be on the hook for center of mass. But for now, we'll just call it the center of the wheel. The center of the wheel is moving at speed v. The outside of the wheel is moving at omega. But those two things are connected. The faster I move the center of the wheel, the faster the wheel turns. And to compound this just a little bit further, how fast, if, if the center of this wheel is moving at speed v, I don't know, let's just say two meters per second, okay? Just to give you a number, because I know your brains like numbers, okay? Let's say the center of this wheel is moving at two meters per second to the right. How fast is the point down here where the wheel meets the desk? How fast is that point moving to the right? Be careful. This is moving to the right at two meters per second, right? Okay. But what is the point on the bottom of the wheel doing? What's its vector direction? It has to be to the left, doesn't it? In order to say, what direction is the top point on the wheel moving? To the right. And what must the speed be, top and bottom and center, for this wheel to stay a circular shape and not fly apart? So taking the, taking the roll out, all points on this wheel need to be moving to the right at two meters per second, yes? Because if they're not, if the top's going at 10 and the center's going at 2, what's happening? It's breaking apart, right? You can't keep the circular shape. So all, if I translate this wheel, all points on it have to move at the same velocity. But we combine that with a rotation where at the bottom it's pointed backwards and the top it's pointed forwards. So if the center's moving at 2 and the top is moving at 2, and it's rotating at two. What, how fast is the top going as this thing rolls? It's already got two because of the sideways motion. And then we give it rotational speed okay, of two also. So what's two plus two up here? Four. What's the center moving at? Two. What's the bottom moving at? Zero. What you done? Wait a second. The bottom is moving at zero? Mr. Bell, how can this thing roll and the bottom not be moving? What kind of friction is it? Static. static. And what must be true about the relative speed between the two surfaces in order for static friction to exist? The relative speed must be zero. How fast is the ground going? Okay, fine, you're going zero, the ground's going backwards at 50 miles an hour. <laughs> the bottom of that wheel has a net speed, a net velocity of zero. The top of the wheel's got a net speed of double the speed of the center of the wheel. And so if your car is going at 65 miles an hour down the freeway, how fast is that patch of rubber that comes into contact with the ground going? Zero unless you're slipping and sliding. How fast is the top of your tire going? 130. 
How fast is the center of your tire wheel going? 65. How do you know the center of your wheel is going 65? Because you're going 65 and you don't want your tire wheel speed to be different than your car speed. Why don't you want the four wheels on your car going a different speed than your car? If your wheels are going 70 and your car is going 65, there's a problem. Right? So, rolling motion, okay, is this complicated vectorness that you can easily handle if you trust that one right there. Because what we do is we say however fast the center of the wheel is going, we can find its angular speed. The angular speed is the same no matter where you are on the wheel, right? Okay. So if the center of the wheel is going two meters per second, we can then calculate the omega just based on the center. So sometimes you'll see this written as V center of mass, V sub COM. They're just saying the center of the wheel, however fast that's going, for pure rolling motion, meaning there's no slipping, there's no sliding. We maintain the static friction. Your center of mass V and your omega are linked. And they're linked through this relationship. So you'll see me all the time when they tell me how fast the car is going, I'll know exactly how fast the wheels are going by using that. As in this example. Okay? So let's do this. <clears throat> now, could we do this entire problem by only using, well, by starting with chapter two. A car is accelerating from zero to 22 meters per second in nine seconds. That sounds exactly like a chapter two problem, doesn't it? So we could do that. We could just work in, in this two locks over here, the old one, right? Okay, the Latin one, not the Greek one, the Latin one, right? And Solve our problem, do whatever it is, right? And then, like, at the end, convert into our angular thing. Or we could convert and just work natively in the angular toolbox because they are asking us how many revolutions does the tire make and the final angular speed, right? So you can choose here. I'm going to model it today by using the Greek ones, just so you get familiar with it and you see more exposure. I know this is going to annoy you, but physicists and engineers do not see a difference between these two toolboxes. They are the same toolbox, different coat of paint, right? Over here the screwdriver has a blue handle, over here it has a red handle. It's still a screwdriver, right? So try not to, you know, try to convince your brain that this is the same thing we've been doing all along in chapter two. Don't make it more complicated than a chapter two problem. But you will need to speak Greek while you do it. So, if we are going to do this all in Greek notation, what do we have to do with that 22 meters per second? We've got to convert it, right, into an angular speed. So how do we... The, so we know the car is driving down the road, which means its tires are rotating, right? And it's pure rolling motion because there's no slipping or sliding. So how do I get the center of mass speed of that tire of 22 meters per second into an angular form? V equals R omega, right? So very first thing I'm going to do is just start tra Google Translate over into the Greek, right? So my center mass speed equals r omega, which means omega is going to be equal to v over r. And so I take the 22 and I divide by, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. I hate this, I hate this. When they give you the diameter of something, what do you have to remember to do? How many times does Mr. Baylor forget to divide by two? All the time, right? So easy to read diameter as radius. 
right? And vice versa. So, okay. So we got to take 58 centimeters, which is 0.58 meters, and divide that by two. I have no idea what that number is. Um, do I even have this one? Nope. I'm having trouble reading my notes today. I'm still convinced that there's a page missing. Got the hard drive, did that one. Yeah, no, okay. So what's 58 divided by 2? 20. 0.29. So 0.29 radians per second. Uh, sorry, 0.29 meters. So 22 meters per second over 0.29 is what? 75.8 75 75 6. Radians per second. So there we go. We got that in there. We don't have to convert the nine seconds, right? Time is time. So what can I know and what can I not know? Well, this right is my list. So I know it started at what? Started at zero. It went to seventy-five point eight six radians per second. I don't know what alpha is, but I do know what time it took. And so if I'm going to find number of revolutions, so what in that list is number of revolutions? What are the units of alpha? Radians per second squared. Is that a revolution? No. What are the units of theta? Radians. And are radians and revolutions related to each other? Yes. So the problem is asking us to solve for this. But what am I going to need before I get there? I'm going to need alpha. Why am I going to need alpha? It's everywhere, right? So how are we going to find alpha? We know t, we know omega, we know omega naught. First equation. So we are going to do the first equation first. And then to solve for what they're asking for, what, uh, what equation can we use then? Um, we can use the second one, right? If we use the second one, we don't have to do any algebra, right? I'm just got to put the numbers in and go. Uh, can we use the third one? Yeah. yeah. Need some algebra and it's got some squares in it. But, uh, so we'll do the first equation and then we will do the second equation. That's our plan. So for the first equation, uh, omega equals omega naught plus alpha t. So alpha is going to be omega minus omega naught over t. I have no idea what that number is. Don't care. Um, and then now that we've got that, we can go in and do our second equation, delta theta omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. And that will give me something in radians. Okay? The, the, the alpha will turn out in radians per second squared. The theta will give me radians, but they want revolutions. So how do I convert from radians to revolutions? I think I heard it out there. Right? However many radians I have, there are two pi radians in one revolution. So now I can answer in revolutions like they want. Right? Sorry, I didn't put the numbers in there because I didn't have my notes. Um, what is the final angular speed of the tire? So, so, well, we found the final angular speed of 75. Problem done. How do you translate between linear and angular quantities? That one right there, right? You can use that one too if you just know accelerations. But usually you use the velocity equation. Sorry, I'm going fast there because there's, there's more. But wait, there's more because 
we need to talk about this. We're going we're gonna to skip Newton's laws for now. I don't think I'm going to get to them today. Okay. Oh, we did those on Wednesday. Uh, but let's talk energy. And what, uh, what's about to happen here is uh, a new idea. Okay. So we know about energy. We're going to do conservation of energy. But there's something that crops up when we deal with rotation that, that we've got to deal with. And what is it? What's, uh, what's kinetic energy, like, like mathematically? Okay, so um, that's for something that's moving in a straight line, right? Something that's just translating. But does this wheel have kinetic energy? It's moving, right? Points on the wheel are moving and all that kind of stuff. So like if we want to do just the, I don't know, the kinetic energy of just this point up here on the wheel, right? Okay, as it rolls around. Instead of using, well, does this point have a V? It's got a tangential V. So what will happen? Let's just, let's, let's be naive. Let's just throw in, right? This, this V tangential equals R omega and see what happens, right? This is our way to get from tangential things to, to rotating things. So let, let's see what happens. So one half M V squared. So that would be R squared omega squared, wouldn't it? And um, that doesn't look like kinetic energy anymore, does it? I mean, kinetic energy is supposed to look like one half times the mass times a speed squared, right? We got the speed squared, got the omega squared in there, but we've messed up the mass with this radius, right? This is what we're going to do. The rotational kinetic energy is going to be one half i omega squared. And now I've made it look like kinetic energy. Right? It looks like it. It's got a one half. It has a speed squared. And it has a messy thing in it. It's a vacuum. It's not lowercase i. It's an uppercase I. And what is I? It's M R squared. And we're going to call it the moment of inertia. Now, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. What's inertia? Good Monday, isn't it? <laughs> you remember inertia from chapter 5? How much an object doesn't want to change its motion, right? So the more inertia something has, the harder it is to get it to accelerate. So we, and mass, mass is a way to kind of capture that idea, isn't it? Mass is the closest thing we come to being able to quantify the inertia of an object. The word moment in this context doesn't mean period of time. It means axis of rotation. That's, that's a, it's a di I, you've probably never heard that definition of moment before. But a moment arm in engineering refers to the distance or length of a lever okay, as it's used to rotate something. So moment of inertia, what it's basically saying is it's rotational mass. My brain just broke. What about yours? <laughs> what the heck is moment of inertia? What is rotational mass? This wheel requires a certain amount of effort to get it to spin. If I made the wheel out of, say, carbon fiber, which is super lightweight and super strong, would it be easier or harder to get the wheel to rotate? Be easier. It would have a lower moment of inertia. But if I made the wheel out of plutonium, which is very dense and very heavy and very hulky and radioactive, how, mu how much effort would I have to expend to rotate that wheel? A lot. 
So it would have a bigger moment of inertia. Okay, what happens if I make the radius of the wheel really tiny? Is it easier to get it to rotate if the radius is smaller? By the square of the factor. You want to change the moment of inertia of something, change its size. <laughs> okay? Because that will give you the most change. If I make this wheel much, much bigger, then it's going to take a lot more moment of inertia to get it to turn. Does this meter stick have moment of inertia? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Why? Because it's mass rotating. Okay. Right. How? So okay. So it has moment of inertia. As you can see, it's it's fairly easy for me to keep it spinning if I spin it around its center. Okay. But what happens if I grab it by the end? And now I want to get it to rotate. I want to flip this thing around. Okay, easier or harder to do this? <laughs> okay, I, this is not theatrics, I'm just a whip. But it takes a lot of, it's a lot more oomph to get this to rotate around this axis than it did to get it to rotate around the center. Okay, why? What changed? where the mass was in relation to where I was spinning the object. If I grab it in the middle, I've got mass on either side, but more importantly, the mass only goes out to half a meter. M R squared, right? 50 centimeters for that math. Same mass, I haven't changed the mass here at all, but now the mass goes out to what? One meter. And I'm squaring that this thing is like four times as hard to get to go around as it is to get it to turn in the center. So, can things that don't look like circles have rotational motion? Absolutely. It doesn't have to be tires. Okay? The way we find the moments of inertia of objects is we take we break it up into lots of little different pieces of mass. We find the distance to that. We know the mass. But let's say we broke this meter stick up into one gram pieces, right? And then we, we, we know one of those is at one centimeter, and one gram, two centimeters, right? And we add all those up this way and that way, and we get the moment of inertia. You can do the same thing over here. Break it up into milligram pieces, right? Thousand pieces all the way. Break it up to a million pieces. A near infinite number of pieces. What are we doing? <laughs> right? Don't panic. We're not going to do any intervals. Okay? We saved them. Again, we saved those for 40. Okay? Technically, to find the moment of inertia of something, we do integrate. Okay? We integrate. All those little masses times their positions, okay, over the total mass of this object. And I know, I know, I know, I know, your brain just went, mm, because Mr. Balo, I know how to do dx. I know how to do dy. I know how to do dz. Some of you know how to do dr or d theta, right? How do you do DM? Well, you play a game called Dungeons and Dragons, and you make sure you're really cruel to the players. Not that kind of game. What's a DM? A message. <laughs> right? It's a little piece of mass. Add up all the little pieces of mass and their distances, right? How do you actually do that? Well. I could spend the next 30 minutes teaching it to you, and uh, you would be enlightened in terms of mathematics. Again, you're going to get it in 4B because you're going to be doing this all the time. What we do instead is we can kind of cheat a little bit, okay, where we sum up all the little MR squares. But, but really, you don't even really want to do that because that could take a long time. What you do is you make somebody else do it. You give mathematicians integrals. They love it, okay? 
And what you end up with, okay, are tables of moments of inertia for various objects. I'm jumping over derivation here. I'm going to go straight to application again because most of you are engineers. So the moment of inertia of basic shapes has already been figured out. Let's leverage <laughs> the blood, sweat, and tears of previous generations, right, and build upon that and start applying it. This is the table that's in your book. I don't like this one. It, it's okay. I, just graphically, I don't, we need a graphic designer to get in here, okay, and make it look nice. This is the table. I like this one better. Uh, the equations are the same. The shapes are the same, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know. This one just feels better to me, okay? And so it comes from a different book, but it's okay. I, I, have, I have permission to use it. This is the table that is going to be on the back cover of your exam. You're going to get this table. You don't have to write these things down on your cheat sheet, okay? I will give you this table. As a matter of fact, I will take a picture of it right now for the PDF, so it will be in the PDF for this set of lecture notes, right? So you'll have a copy of it. Um, but what we do, and, and you're going to want to have this table with you at all times. Like seriously. Put it in your phone, put it in your wallet, hang it up on your bathroom mirror. You are going to be referencing this table constantly to find the moments of inertia of objects. You can even build more complicated objects out of these simple shapes to get total moments of inertia. So let's use just a few examples here. Um, what shape would you use here if we were uh, trying to find the moment of inertia of a bowling ball? H? Yeah, it says solid sphere, right? And so we're just told, they've done the integration for us in spherical coordinates. And they've told us it ends up being 2 fifths times the total mass of the ball times its outer radius. Big R means largest radius. Okay? So great. Now we know the moment of inertia of a bowling ball. But what if we wanted to find the moment of inertia of a water polo ball? Can't use H. Why can't we use H? Solid. It's not solid, right? There's air inside of this ball. As a matter of fact, all of the mass is concentrated in a thin rubber lining around the outside. So which one am I going to use? I'm going to use I, right? And notice, which of the... So if I had a water polo ball and a bowling ball that were the same mass, and they are normally very different masses, right? Okay, bowling balls are heavier. But let's just say they had the same mass. Which one would have a larger moment of inertia? H or I? I. I. It says two thirds, doesn't it? Instead of two fifths, two fifths is smaller than two thirds. Things that have their mass concentrated far away from their axes of rotation have more moment of inertia. The bowling ball is less because its mass is spread out. Some of its mass is close to the center, some of its mass is towards the outside. The blue lines on this diagram are the axis about which those things are turning, right? So for the water, I can't do this, right? Okay. But it's spinning around okay, on an axis through its center. But does the axis have to be vertical? Is this the same? Yes. Okay. So which one of these would you use for um, for a bicycle tire? G for the tire. But what about the entire bicycle wheel? Mm -hmm. Is it E, where there's like some mass that's spread out? Or is it F, where there's like mass all the way through? Does this bicycle tire have mass all the way through? No. <gasps> Wait a second. We can do that? I just said we can add these together, right? So what would a tire, what shapes could we, to do this entire bicycle tire, 
right? What can we do? We could do a solid cylinder. What's that one? F, okay, for the central hub. And then we could do a whole bunch of Bs. all rotating around an axis at their end, and then add that to a G. So it would be like 1F plus, I don't know, 40 Bs plus a G. And what would I get? I would get the moment of inertia of that structure. That's how you do it. That's how you do integrals without doing integrals, okay? Because all of these things are based on integrals. Now, of course, some objects are very complicated and automotive engineers, they really want to know the moment of inertia of a car. Why would you want to know the moment of inertia of the entire vehicle? That's straight line stuff. Moment of inertia is about rotation. And how much do you want your car rotating on its axis as you drive down the road? Not at all. How many axes can there be in a car? There's a vertical axis, a horizontal axis, and then another horizontal axis, right? So the car, the car could be spinning down the road like this, right, okay? Rolling over but going straight. It could be going down the road flipping over like this, or it could be going down the road, turning around, right? What do you want the moment of inertia to be on all of those axes? Not zero. As big as possible. Because the bigger the moment of inertia, the harder it is to get the object to rotate. Remember, inertia is all about the more inertia you have, the harder it is to change the motion. So, we're going to be, moment of inertia is with you for the rest of your life. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Because it's just going to be with you. And you're going to want this table out with you, printed out, tattooed on something. I don't know. But you're, you're, going, to, you're going to want it. Okay? So, let's, you know what? Let's do quiz first. Let's do the quiz first, and then we'll do the example. With all the bodies? Yeah, unfortunately not. <laughs> all right, so let me do this. I've got five minutes. Let me do this quickly. Okay. We're going to do a comparison. We're going to take the same bowling ball, but we're going to do a chapter... Five, uh, chapter eight problem, and then we're gonna do this chapter's problem, okay? So, back in chapter eight, if we just had a ball, and it doesn't roll, it just slides down the ramp, okay? And we wanna find out how fast it's going. Well, I already know the answer to that. It starts with MGH, it ends up with one half MV squared, and so if I do my energy conservation, it's just gonna be one half MV squared equals MGH, and I'm going quickly, and I get square root of 2gh. Because anything that's going down a frictionless ramp has speed square root of 2gh at the bottom, right? There's no friction, and it starts at zero speed, the answer is zero. How, many, how often do you, hear, do you see square root of 2gh? Like all the time. So if you are lost, if you are guessing, what should you guess? Square root of 2gh. You'll be right like 33% of the time. Okay? So square root of 2gh is the answer. Um, so it was 42, if you understand that reference. Okay, so that was back in chapter 8. Now, I'm going to do the problem, but this time it's going to roll down the hill. Okay, so it's, again, it's going to start up here, it's going to end down here, my initial, my final. It does start with MGH, but what does it end with? It ends? Oh, oh, is it rolling when it gets to the bottom? Yes. So it has one half I omega squared. But that's not all. 
What else does it have? Yes, the T word. Translation. Moving in a straight line. Is it center of mass going places? Ah, so it has one half mv squared. Uh oh. How many different forms of potential energy do we know about? Two. We know mgh and we know one half kx squared, right? Springs and gravity. How many kinds of kinetic energy do we now know about? One half mv squared and one half i omega squared. Three. What's three? Gravity well, gravity and springs is potential, right? Two different kinds of potential energy. And now two different kinds of kinetic energy we need to be kept track of. All right. These two all have to add up to each other, right? Uh, it, oh, okay. Darn. Is there friction here? Yes, there is. There's static friction here. Why do I know there's static friction? It's rolling. You can't have any rolling without any kind of static friction. Do I need to worry about static friction when it comes to work other? No. Kinetic friction, you do. Static friction, you don't. Just like gravity, you don't have to worry about that force because we have MGH, gravitational potential energy. Static friction is taken care of in 1 half I omega squared. One half i omega squared wouldn't exist without static friction. So static friction is, is tied up in there. So when it comes to work other, what kind of friction do you need to worry about? Kinetic, right? Or any other form of propulsion or slowing it down. OK. So I solved this for v. Problem. Where's v? How many places does V appear? Two. This is one half MV squared. Where's the other V? It's hiding in omega, right? It's hiding in omega because V equals R omega, so that means omega is equal to V over R. Whatever the center of mass speed is, we you know we know it's we know it's omega. And for a bowling ball whose moment of inertia was 2 fifths mr squared, we can now go in here and do 1 half times 2 fifths mr squared times omega squared, and omega was v over r, and both of those things are squared, equals, oh, I forgot the 1 half. Oh, my gosh. This is, this is horrible. Look at, look at how, look at this. Ah! This is, it just blew up on me, didn't it? But wait, hold out hope. Knew there was a reason we were doing this in symbols. No, that M doesn't cancel. Uh, that R squared cancels with that R squared. Ooh, do the M's cancel? Do I have an M in every term? <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And now I'm left with 1 fifth V squared plus 1 half V squared equals GH. And a fifth plus a half is... Um, Seven tenths? Did I do that right? Yeah. I think I did that right. Seven over ten, v squared equals gh, which means v is equal to the square root of ten over seven gh. Which one of these is faster? The square root of two gh or the square root of ten sevenths gh? Two is bigger than ten sevenths. So which one's moving faster when we get to the bottom of the hill? Why? Where did the energy go? They started with the same potential energy, right? MGH is exactly the same for both of them. So where did the velocity, where did the 1 half mv squared go? Into rotation. They have exactly the same energy at the bottom. It's just the rolling one has to split that energy up between translation, center mass moving in a straight line, and the energy of rotation. And since some of the energy went into rotation, that's energy that wasn't available for translation. I will 
I might not finish on Wednesday. We'll see what happens. I hope to finish on Wednesday, Chapter 10. See you then.